Hey, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to continue on with our third episode in this series where we discuss making our own angle of attack sensor for general aviation. In this episode, we're going to talk about how to wire up the electronics. Before we get into that though, I'd like to do a disclaimer. This video series describes how I engineered my own angle of attack sensor built from off-the-shelf electronics and 3D printed parts, which communicate angle of attack data over a Bluetooth link to an Android device to display real-time angle of attack values in the cockpit. This is an experimental device and I have no interest in making it a commercial product for sale. You do not have my permission to build and sell this design, but you may use it for yourself. I'm not a certified flight instructor and this device is not a certified product. By building one, you're taking your life and the lives of your passengers into your own hands. As pilot in command, you have the final responsibility for the safe outcome of every flight. The device may be used to improve overall situational awareness, but it is not designed for and should not be used as a primary instrument for flight. All right, now that we have the disclaimer out of the way, let's go ahead and uh, start our discussion. I think the first thing I wanna do is talk about how uh, I came to which electronics to use for this build um, after lots and lots of thought and <laughs> lots of iterations of, of trial and error. Uh, what I came up with um, was the use of an Arduino device. Uh, Arduino has recently come out with um, some Bluetooth capability, which is kind of cool, and I thought that, that would be a good use for that. Uh, the most important uh, design, design decision that I made on this, though, was um, what kind of sensor to use to actually sense the, uh, the angle of attack. Uh, the, my first iteration, um, and I didn't get very far with this one, I started to think about barometric pressure sensors. Um, if you have multiple barometric sensors set up, um, on a pitot tube type of device um, with different angles um, from which the wind hits. Um, and on each side, you might have a hole going back to a sensor here and a hole going back to a sensor here. And depending on the angle that this is at, you're gonna get straighter uh, relative wind hitting it directly and less directly, or if you're at a higher angle of attack, more directly and less directly. Basically this uh, sensor, the uh, silver chip right here in the top, that's the actual barometric sensor. And inside of that is a little tiny hole uh, that actually measures and then will push out data uh, depending on how much pressure it actually senses. From a 3D printing standpoint, I think that the materials probably would not have held uh, pressure very well unless I printed them really thick. And, and uh, in that case, you, you end up maybe with different sized holes and stuff anyway. So uh, I didn't think that was gonna work out very well. So I quickly decided that it was I should probably do something uh, mechanical to measure the uh, the angle instead. Uh, my first thought on that was to use a potentiometer. Um, if you're familiar with um, electronics, um, you can probably skip ahead, but uh, if you're not, then uh, we'll talk about what a potentiometer is. Um, if you think about uh, like a volume control on your car stereo or whatever, the knob that you turn uh, could be on a guitar or something like that too, if you play guitar. Um, there's a potentiometer on there that you can change the volume, and it's basically just a knob that's connected to a shaft that is then able to measure how much twist is in something. And the way these things work, here's a, here's one that I, I first purchased. It's a potentiometer. Um, if you look inside of the hole here, there's a, it's a D shaft that it would take. Um, so I 3D printed a, a little D shaft here. Um, so you can see that it's got kind of a, a slot cut in the hole. It's not a complete circle. As I turn this, it'll actually turn uh, the sensor on the inside. And the way this works is you have power going in in the red wire, you have power going out on the brown wire, and this yellow wire is your signal wire. And basically what happens is the power goes in and then back out over here, and depending on how far you turn this knob, it uses electrical resistance to determine how much power comes out the gold wire or the yellow wire here. The issue is that it's not, as I was doing some testing on this particular one, it would sometimes lose the uh, precision that it, that it started with. So, um, you know, if you start here with exactly 90 degrees from whatever, straight up and down here, um, sometimes it would measure 90 and then I would turn it here and then go back and it wouldn't be 90 anymore, it would change. Um, if I went up here and then went back down, it might not be 90 again. Um, and so my next iteration was to, to get a rotary encoder. Um, this one ran into some issues as well. 
Uh, this is what's known as a, an incremental uh, rotary encoder. And what that basically means is that every time this shaft turns, it will report back how many degrees it's turned, <clears throat> which is what we want. The issue is that it doesn't know exactly where it is. It only tells you how much it's changed since the last reading. That should be fine and dandy in a perfect world. Um, every time that this thing changes, it should report back and say, well, I've turned three degrees since the last time, or I've changed five degrees from the last time. As long as our Arduino, the brains of the whole system here, can keep up and never loses a signal, that's fine. It, it can just do the addition subtraction of the different angles and, and you're good to go. That's not what happens in the real world though. There's always, you know, especially if we're passing data via Bluetooth and things like that, there's always gonna be a slight delay um, when there's any data being passed um, at all. Uh, so there's a very high likelihood that you're gonna miss at least one signal, probably, you know, a signal every second. And over the course of, you know, a minute, you might be 90 degrees off or something like that. So an incremental encoder was never gonna be sufficient and one other problem we have with these incremental encoders, um, this, this one in particular, is that it, if you leave it alone for a few seconds, occasionally this uh, shaft will actually seize up and it will take an extra bit of pressure to actually get it to turn before it finally breaks free. There it goes. And you can see that the whole, the whole device is turning right now until I kind of break free from that. So, you know, mechanically it may not turn uh, freely, um, we obviously want this to turn as freely as possible so you can get a really good measurement on it. Um, and what that led me to was uh, my final decision um, and the one that I went with. Um, this is what we call an absolute rotary encoder. It's an AS500, the little chip that's on, on here is called the AS500. Um, the way that this one works, inside of here there's a little uh, magnet. And this magnet, what's special about it is it's what's called di a diametrically uh, magnetized magnet. And what that means is that, and, and you'd probably look at this and say, well, the top and the bottom are probably the north and the south poles of this, but that's not, that's not accurate. If you were to take this and cut it in half, like a pie, one half over here, for example, might be the north facing pole of this magnet, and this side over here might be the south facing pole. Um, and why that's important and why it's done in this way is that if you put this on the end of a shaft, and that shaft starts to spin, um, that magnet is, is turning like this and that pole will change directions depending on how far it's gone in a circle. So what happens is the as the magnet turns, this Hall effect sensor here, the AS500, senses which direction it is turning. So if, if this pencil here, for example, the eraser here was actually the magnet, it would be, you know, a millimeter away or something like that. And as this thing turns, this black sensor here in the middle can tell exactly what angle it's sitting at depending on where the north and south pole is. So the, the sensor here will give out 12-bit uh, data. What 12-bit data means is that for every time this thing turns in a circle, we're not just getting a single degree, right? Like a, t a full circle is 360 degrees. Instead of slicing a circle into 360, it'll slice it into 4,096 parts. So you can get very, very, it's, it's less than a tenth of a degree that it can measure this down to, which means we can get very high accuracy in our reading. And because it uses the Hall effect, um, it's never going to change. It's not going to be like the incremental one where we can sometimes lose a degree or two in there. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of how this will work with the project, here's the lid um, of the 3D printed uh, sensor. This will actually slide right into this part right here. Right, and that holds it nice and tight. It's not going anywhere. Okay, and so the inside of the uh, sensor will sit right in here. The shaft will turn like this, and that's how we get our reading. All right, so let's go ahead and start talking about uh, how this is all wired up. Um, I have a wiring diagram, um, and I should also mention that I have several parts um, that are beyond kind of what we've just talked about, just the sensor and, and that stuff. Um, if you go out to my website, danderflieger.com, um, there's, a, there's a parts list that will be, um, that'll show you everything that you need to buy to do everything that's in this video. So this is what our wiring diagram looks like. Um, everything that we need is right here on this diagram. There's five devices. There's the AS5600, which we talked about already. 
There's the Arduino device, which we've talked about already. There's a power cable. Um, this, if you notice, uh, if you've messed around with nine volt batteries before, it's got the right header pins for a nine volt battery. Um, in this case, we actually are going to connect it uh, to four AA batteries. And this uh, battery holder actually has one of these nine volt battery uh, connectors on it. So um, in the end, this will be inside of the device. This is a removable part of the device and we can just use this to hook in our battery and then we can pull this out um, and recharge the batteries or you know replace them with uh, other double A's or however you want to do it. Um, lots of different ways to connect power to this thing. But um, So that's another part that we'll be using today. Um, we also have a little three volt uh, LED. This is a very a three millimeter I'm not sure this is going to get into focus, but, and then we also have a switch that will go into the side of our device. So this has a small screw on it. So this button will go into the hole here. And then there's a bulkhead lock nut here that goes on the back side and we'll hold it into place. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. But um, basically the idea is that we need to have a button on the outside of the device so that we can turn it on and turn it off without having to open the case every time. That's what that's for. Um, on my website, um, on the parts list, I have two different buttons um, listed there. This is the one you probably want to get. This actually does have a light inside. I recommend not using that light because this, um, the light within this switch is designed for 12 volts, you're gonna end up running your battery out for no good reason. Um, and instead what I've done is I've written some code um, to have the Arduino make this uh, LED light light up and it will sort of blink on occasion uh, just to let you know it's doing something and it uses far less power than having a solid light on the switch that's on all the time. Um, the idea is to have the batteries last as long as possible so you're not running into a scenario where halfway through a flight you have a dead battery and your angle of attack sensor no longer functions for you. Uh, another reason for uh, this switch with the light on the top is that they come with these uh, lead wires. It has kind of this adapter that goes onto the end of it. You plug it in and all your wiring is done for you. And you don't have to solder wires directly into the switch which makes it more difficult to like you'd have to actually put this into place before you solder it to the board and then you can't take it apart later if you need to. Um, so the idea is to just have um, removable cords that can just plug into the back. Now you can, the design is big enough that you can actually um, plug this in with the adapter on there and all. But what I found works better and I prefer to do is you can actually disassemble um, the wires, a couple of the wires from inside of here and just use those instead. Um, Instead of having this whole big blue part here, you just have a very small um, wire clip that goes onto the back. Another thing that I've put on my list of things to purchase is some of this uh, heat shrink. Uh, basically what you do with this is you uh, will put it over the top of wires. Let's say you, you, know, you make a circuit here, you solder some wires together, you put this over the top between the two, and then as you heat this up with a heat gun, um, this will shrink around it. And the, the particular type that I put um, on the parts list it has um, sort of like a hot glue um, within the inside diameter of the tube um, and that seals it, uh, makes it watertight as well. Another thing on the list is um, solid core tinned copper wire. This particular one that I put on the list, I bought it in, on Amazon. It has several different colors um, and within it has, like I said, solid core copper and it's pre-tinned which means it's much, much easier to solder. Another thing that I, I recommend highly is a nice pair of wire strippers. Uh, this one I, I picked up at AutoZone a little while back for I think you know eight dollars or something like that. And then the last thing I recommend, uh, these things, I think they're called magic fingers. And what this will allow you to do is as you're trying to solder things, you can just clip this and it holds it in place for you while you're putting wires into place. All right, so let's go quickly over our wiring diagram. You can print this off and, uh, you know, it's good to have a paper copy. That's why I have one here in front of me as well. Um, we'll start with the legend. Each of these little blocks here represent a, wa a wire and, and it discusses what those wires are for. So I'll be using a yellow wire to connect the, the Ace 5600. The VCC hole will connect over to the lead on the Arduino that says 3.3 volts. 
If you look at the green wire over here, um, we're going to use this to connect the AS5600 SCL. There's actually seven leads on here, but we're only going to use the four. VCC, GND, SCL, and SDA. So the SCL and SDA have to do with um, one of the communications uh, standards that this board supports, which is I2C. Um, SCL is the clock speed. Um, so basically, if you think of like people on a boat rowing the boat and there's somebody in the back beating the drum to tell you to, when to row, that's kind of what the SCL does. It kind of keeps everything in time. It tells the Arduino when to read and when it's going to send a signal. Um, and then the SDA is the data port. That's actually what it, what it uses to send the data from the chip out to the Arduino. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's what these two boxes here are for. We've got um, a green, which uh, demonstrates it goes from the A5 lead on the Arduino, and that goes up to the SCL, so the clock lead on the sensor. And then the A4 is the white one. And we'll, again, we'll use this color wire because that's what we have in our kit. So green wire goes between SCL and A5. The white wire is going to go between SDA and A4. Um, our GND on the Arduino on the one side will go between the AS500 and the negative uh, lead for the power um, for the battery. Um, and then the positive for that is going to come down. So here we go again. We've got two red wires here. One red wire goes from the switch, uh, the, the, the six volt positive is going to go over to one side of the switch and then if the switch is depressed then the power is going to go through the switch and then it's going to go from the other side of the switch up and then connect into the VIN pin uh, that means voltage in on the Arduino device all right um, and then there's two more wires we need to talk about here we've got another ground wire uh, one's going to go up and then over to the shorter lead on the LED so the thing about LEDs um, it's called a light emitting diode um, in electronics, a diode is a device that ensures the power only flows in one direction. So if you try to hook up your LED backwards, power is just not going to go through. It's not going to do anything. It has a specific positive and a specific negative uh, lead on it, and you have to get it right. The long lead is uh, positive, and the short lead is negative on almost, as far as I know, every um, LED that you can buy in a kit like, like the kit that I bought here. Um, so the ground is going to go into the GND on the one side of the board, and then on the same side of the board there's another pin that is labeled D8, that's digital 8. Alright, so uh, I'll go ahead and start um, soldering stuff in. Um, I should also mention that I have um, a decent, I'll put this over here too, I have a decent uh, soldering kit here that I got for I think it's you know, 35 bucks or something like that on Amazon. Um, my particular one it has a nice switch to it and it has a temperature control. I like mine to run around 400 for the uh, for the solder that came with my kit. 400 degrees works pretty well for it. Um, and so this tells you, you can see it's counting up right now. All right, so I'll go ahead and start um, with the AS5600. And if we follow our, uh, our wiring scheme, um, the 5600, uh, the VCC line, is going to be a yellow cord. So I'll get out my yellow cord here. I'll cut off a wire that's about, I don't know, three or four inches long here. So I'll use the 18 gauge hole on my wire strippers. And then if you look here, I'm going to go ahead and put the wire up through the VCC hole. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull out my soldering iron here over a little bit of solder as well. So I've got my VCC connection soldered into place. I'm not really happy with that so I'm going to go ahead and pull that out. All right well that was kind of a pain in the neck to get that situated. Basically what happened is I uh, put the wire into place. Um, I didn't like the way it was seated. It kind of melted through some of the uh, the insulation on it a little bit more than I liked. Um, and I just could not get the solder to, to really sit in there very well. So I tried to pull it out. I ended up having to use a solder remover, um, this tool right here. Basically the way this works is it has a little plunger that you push down and lock it into place. And then when you heat up the solder that you want to uh, remove, uh, it's melted. You push this button and it pops up and it creates a suction which pulls the solder <coughs> out of your joint and into this device. 
Um, so I had to do that and it still didn't get all of it out. Uh, it takes a little practice, so I'm going to do this again. Uh, I'm not 100% happy with that, but um, we'll move on. All right, then we also need a piece of black wire about the same length. Again, this one is going to be our ground uh, for the AS5600. Move some of the insulation from around the tip of this. Next we'll do our uh, clock wire. And our clock wire, if we look at our diagram, uh, the clock wire is going to be green, so we'll pull out a section of green wire, cut that off, and then trim it as well. should mention that these wires are all going on the bottom side with the letters up on the uh, sensor here. And the reason why is because you don't want those wires in the way. We're going to have to actually trim off the, the part that's sticking up over the top so we have free range. Um, oh, that one actually worked really well. And then we need a white wire for our data. So I can cut off a chunk of wire about the same length. Remove the uh, insulation on it. This one goes into the SDA, the data line for the I2C connection. Some people call that I squared C. Um, I'm not sure which one's right. I've heard it both ways. I think that I2C rolls off the tongue a little better. All right, so SDA is in place, and I just have to solder it. Um, so what I'll do is the power coming out the bottom, basically the, the side that has the SCL and the SDA, that's kind of the top of the sensor. Um, and then the yellow and the black wire here, I'll kind of fold back on the back side. And then I'll fold these other two and keep them straight. Just because there's very limited room be behind it um, inside of the 3D printed part. So I'll just fold this over and just kind of keep it all nice and flat up against that. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna do is you'll see on the front of the sensor here, if I can get this uh, in the right spot, um, there's those little leads that are coming out. So I just usually go through and I clip those off. Um, um, so what I'm gonna do is just come along and clip these as short as I can, just so that they're not interfering with moving parts inside the sensor when we're done. So at this point, there's not really any wires poking out there are gonna interfere with that sensor. And we should be good. All right, so the next thing that uh, we're gonna work on is the switch uh, for the power. Um, if you buy the kind that has the button that has the, uh, the leads on it, this is what we really wanna get to here. This particular one has four cables coming out of it. Uh, two of them, the green ones, are the ones that uh, are the power that goes in and then goes through the switch and then comes back out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out the uh, the two green wires. Um, the easiest way to do this is just to get a good hard grip on this, twist it around your finger or something, and just pull it out. And you'll see that as it comes out, it, the uh, end stays on it. This is what we're really interested in is this little clip. Clips on, holds it in place cut off a short piece of our uh, heat shrink. You only need just a small piece. And that will go over the top of our lead here. But you just want to make sure that this stays as close to the end of this as you can. Um, and what that does is it keeps the wire protected from touching anything. Uh, just to demonstrate that, I'll go ahead and do it using our uh, magic fingers here to hold it in place and my soldering iron. I usually use this top part of the soldering iron. It can get contaminated if you get rubber and that kind of stuff on the actual tip. Aha. Uh -huh. I think I figured out um, why I was having so much trouble getting my heat right. The uh, 
the shaft here on my soldering iron was loose, so I had to tighten up this little nut on the bottom. Anyway, so you can just use this part down here on the soldering iron. And you can see that the heat shrink is kind of getting tight around it. Yeah, and that's what it should look like when you're done. It's just uh, it's nice and solid on there. It's not going to pop off. Kind of just clips into place. And that's it. I'm going to do the same thing with the other one. This cable is probably a little too long anyway, so we're going to cut, maybe give ourselves three inches or so. Alright, so what we need to do next is connect our switch to our leads that are going to come off of this thing. Um, if you remember, um, the ones that matter are the two that are close together. The two that are on the outside, the two wide ones, those are for running power up to the, uh, to the LED within the switch, to the light, which we're not going to use. Um, so what we want to do next is I'll go ahead and tin the ends of this to make it easier to solder other wires to them. Basically just get a little bit of solder into the wire. And that way it's easier to just melt the solder again uh, when we cook up a second wire to it. Now what do these connect to? One of these connects into the board, the Arduino board. The other one connects to the positive cable on our power cable coming in. Um, so again, we don't need this much cable. Um, to give you an idea, this is where this is going to go. Um, this power terminal goes back here. It will slide into a little slot and then it has to come up to our switch which is going to be right here. So we really only need, you know, maybe an inch or, or two on this. So I'm just going to cut off, you know, maybe give it two inches here. There we go. Strip these wires back a little bit. And then again, we will tin the tip of the positive one. We won't do the negative one just yet because we've got something we've got to do with that. And then before we actually attach the positive to the positive here, um, what I would like to do is put just a little tiny bit of our heat shrink over that wire. It's enough to cover up uh, what we're about to do, right? Slide this over the top. So you can see our joint here, it's now soldered together very well. Both sides were tinned first and that makes it really easy to just melt a little more solder into it and then you make a really good joint. Then we just slide our heat shrink over the top of that and then we'll just melt that around it and that seals that up. So if you want to, you could, instead of using heat shrink, you could use electrical tape. I highly recommend you don't do that. Um, if you do happen to use electrical tape, what'll happen is over time, the uh, adhesive on the back of the tape comes loose and then you end up, uh, you know, it may come unraveled and then you have a, a possibility for having a short circuit within uh, your sensor. Next, what we're gonna do is connect the Arduino. Now, um, with the Arduino, we're actually going to have the wires coming out the top as opposed to coming out the bottom. You'll notice that these pins that have the white around it, those are your ground pins. You have two of them on your Arduino. Our first two pins that we're going to use over here, one's going to be our voltage in. So that's going to come from our switch, the other end of our switch that we haven't already uh, soldered. Um, that's going to go into our first pin here. And then our second pin is going to be ground, which is going to come from our battery terminal. The ground pin from that's going to go into there. But that is also going to be used uh, for the ground that goes into our AS5600. Uh, so this wire here that we just soldered onto this device is going to end up going into this ground pin right here. If you look at this, we don't need 
you know, that's, that's the length of the entire um, device. The batteries are going to sit back here. The Arduino is going to be right here. The sensor is going to sit about here on the lid. So what we want to do next is cut off three inches um, of this wire. We only need a three inch lead on these. Um, so I'm just going to cut it off right there. And then we will strip off the ends of these wires so that we have something we can solder to. All right. So our ground wires are what we'll do is what we'll do first. Um, first put in the power and then slide in the AS5600. That makes a good solid connection there. Um, and then I will flip this over. Looks like we've got a pretty good solid connection there. Next we want to add in our switch end. So we have one end of the switch and that's going to go right into the VIN connection. At this point, we can actually power up our board using our switch. Plug our switch into the two near poles. If we add power to this, we should be able to see a light on our Arduino. We've plugged it in, push the button, we see the little light come on. Next connection will go our green wire to the analog 5 on the Arduino. See that I have it into the A5 connection as per our diagram. Green wire into A5. Go ahead and solder that wire into place. And then our uh, white wire into the A4 connection on the Arduino. Solder it into place. And then the last one for this device is going to be the 3.3 volt connection. last two wires we need to connect are for the LED. So we need again about three inches or so of black and about the same length of the blue wire here. ground wire first. All right. Ground wire is in place right on the other side where the ground is. All right and then our blue wire goes into digital 8 pin on the Arduino. So digital 8 is right here. You can see the little D8 next to it hopefully. take our small clippers and we cut off any excess wire here sticking out the back side because we don't want that in our way when we go to insert all of this into the device. All right then the last thing we need to do is cut off a couple more small pieces of this uh, heat shrink. Slide those onto each of the blue and the black wires that are not connected to anything at this point. Those are going to be for our LED. 
And I'll pinch these into the magic fingers here so we can do some work on them. If you remember, the LED has two sides on it. One's a shorter one, one's a longer one. So the way this is set up right now, blue wire is our positive that will be feeding the power to the LED. The black wire here will go to the shorter one on the LED, which is what will uh, give us the negative power. Um, but I don't want these long leads on there, so what I'm going to do is cut them off one at a time and make them much shorter, solder into place, and then we'll use heat shrink to cover that up so that we don't have any run the risk of actually uh, short-circuiting anything in there. Um, so the first thing I'll do is the short one. I'll pull these apart a little bit to make it a little easier. Um, I'll cut the short one off first, and then I'll solder that up here nice and close. Okay, and then the next thing I'm going to do is cut off the longer lead, which is now going to be our positive cable. And we'll solder those two wires together. Alright, so we have two LED leads on there that should be good. Just a little bit of solder on each one, and then because we've already put on our heat shrink, we can just slide those up to the top, shrink those down, and then we'll keep that nice and covered. So let me go ahead and just assemble this really quick so you can see how this works together. Basically how this works is the Arduino goes in with the USB connector on the back side going towards the batteries. Um, there's a little spot down here with little pins where the corners of the Arduino just pop into place, just like that. Our battery terminal connects right down inside of here. Our switch will go through. I should also mention that these two green wires that go uh, to the switch, they are interchangeable. You can put either one in either place as long as they are on the two leads on the switch itself uh, that are closest together. The uh, sensor will then go onto the lid, and slides into place like that. And then this part opens in the back. Our battery terminal. Here, All right. Then once we get the battery in, we turn on the, we push the button here. We should see a green light turn on on the Arduino, which we do. Um, and then once I connect the app to uh, the sensor, uh, this light will start flashing, letting us know that it has a solid connection to it and it's doing something. So that kind of wraps up this video. And in the next video, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll talk about the 3D printing process. Everything from uh, I'll do a quick. Uh, tutorial on how I export my files from SOLIDWORKS into uh, an STL file and then from an STL file how I convert that into a G-code file and then from a G-code file how it actually prints on the printer and what all that means in between. Uh, hopefully you found it helpful. Um, I will post uh, wiring diagrams um, and instructions on how to do this. We'll see you soon.